Hi, welcome to everybody. Welcome to both our online and in-person audience to fertility preservation and egg freezing. Thank you to our session sponsors, uh, Eggsurance and New England Fertility Institute. Sorry. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator, Bridget Adams, founder of Eggsurance. She is passionate about getting the word out about egg freezing. Bridget thought she would wait to have children. When she finally looked into egg freezing, she was almost over the cutoff age of, of 38. Realizing that many women are in the same situation, Bridget created Eggsurance as a safe and welcoming place to explore egg freezing and meet like-minded women. Bridget? Great, thank you. Um, so that was a great introduction. I don't really have much more to add, but um, I did create the site because I froze my eggs and I just didn't find the information I wanted or needed to help me go through the process. So the site is really um, an information and community site where people can come, exchange information, and learn more about egg freezing because I think as you all know, it's a new, relatively new procedure that is changing you know, monthly, yearly. So it's a lot to keep up on it. Um, and I'm really excited to be here at the Fertility Planet show and I'm welcoming the online users as well. Um, and I'd like to introduce our two panelists today. Um, first of all, this session is sponsored by the New England Fertility Institute and Dr. LeVay is um, the director at that institute as well as Sarah Richards who recently wrote a book on egg freezing called Motherhood Rescheduled. So we do have a great audience today. And just give you guys a, a chance to just introduce yourself briefly before we jump right into questions and just explain a little more. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Gad Levy. I'm a physician. Uh, I've been working in IVF for many years, uh, actually probably over 25 years now. And uh, I've been fortunate in a way to be at the right place at the right time with the and science of IVF actually evolved. So many things that we actually thought were impossible you know, years ago uh, all of a sudden are becoming a reality. And, and actually this includes uh, egg freezing as well. For, from the beginning, it, um, we knew that freezing human eggs was a big challenge. Uh, for many years, in fact, 100 years, we've been able to freeze sperm. Uh, we've been able to freeze embryos, actually, shortly after, within less than 10 years from when IVF first started. But freezing eggs was always a challenge, mostly because of the fact that the eggs uh, just happened to be the largest cell in the body. The sperm is actually the smallest cell in the body. And with a large cell actually comes technical difficulty as far as, as freezing. And without you know, boring you with the details, it's basically about the water content of the cell and the damage that the ice crystals that form in the process of freezing can actually cause uh, basically cell damage. So uh, there was some work in the 80s which was abandoned because the success was very poor. And again, in, you know, about 10 years ago, some preliminary work. And what the, the, I think the mistake was initially that we were trying to apply exactly the same methodology that we used for embryos and for sperm to eggs. And that's what we used to call the slow freeze, uh, which is a basically controlled lowering of the temperature, which, which basically allows the uh, cell to adjust and, and uh, works very well actually for most cells in the body. But unfortunately, it didn't work very well for the eggs. And um, it was only recently, within the last few years, that the technology has switched to what's called vitrification, uh, flash freeze, fast freeze, uh, which is a very different method. Uh, basically, the temperature is lowered instantly from room temperature to uh, liquid nitrogen temperature. Uh, within, within an instant, and it turns out that by doing that, you actually bypass that stage where the cell damage is, is caused. So that uh, actually turned out to be a perfect uh, method for freezing eggs, uh, and once that actually was established, we went back and now freezing embryos using exactly the same method. So just to put it in perspective, I mean, even though we have really good success, and good success means that there is over 90% survival of the eggs. 
and there's very high rates of fertilization, which are very similar to those that we have with fresh eggs. And basically, the same success with pregnancies uh, as we do with fresh eggs. But just the fact that this is still new and the amount of data that is available about egg freezing is relatively small, mostly because, as I'll explain in a minute, in many cases when egg freezing is used to, for fertility preservation, uh, the eggs are frozen and not really used for quite a while. So uh, most of the information actually that we have so far about uh, egg freezing and success comes from egg donors. So in other words, when we use egg donors, in the past, always the donor and the recipients have to, had to cycle together uh, because we couldn't freeze the eggs. And once the egg freezing has become a reality, we are able now to freeze the eggs and create an egg bank, which is sort of the equivalent of a sperm bank. And there, the eggs are actually not frozen for very long. So it can be frozen for a month or six months or a year. And we have an opportunity to right away see the outcomes, how they survive and how they fertilize and the pregnancy outcomes and so forth. So that gave us actually a lot of confidence to start offering egg freezing for other indications as well. So for example, the first thing that came to mind is, is which often actually happens with men that are diagnosed with cancer or any other condition that requires medication that will affect sperm production or egg production. That used to be, a, actually still is, a routine call, usually Friday afternoon. A guy goes in and he needs to have his sperm frozen right away because he's about to start chemotherapy. Um, we never actually had the same to offer to women. Uh, we used to say, well, you know, if you have a partner, you can make embryos, uh, we can use donor eggs, and we can create the embryos. But actually, just to freeze an egg for a woman who doesn't have a partner, who basically is not ready to be pregnant, was not possible. So that actually allowed us then to offer to these women who are about to undergo surgery to remove the ovaries, chemotherapy for cancer, using other drugs that we know will affect ovarian fun function. So that's sort of very straightforward, actually, as far as an indication. And as long as you, you know, people understand you know, the fact that it's still a new technology and we still don't have a lot of data, uh, that's fine. But then, of course, became, so we came to the next step. Uh, we say, well, you know, we know, and that's another thing that we've been aware of forever, is that the window, the reproductive window for women is, is relatively short. Uh, men continually produce new sperm, and they can actually have fertile sperm at 60 or 70 or 80 years old. Uh, women have a very, a relatively sh narrow window, and most women, by the time they get into their early 40s, uh, experience a sharp drop in fertility. And that results in low chances of pregnancy, high risk of miscarriage. And that has a lot of social reasons, uh, cultural reasons, delaying childbirth, and so forth. Uh, and a lot of also with misinformation about the fact that, you know, again, I mean, you're going to have your career and, and all that. And by the time you're ready to have children, it may be too late. Uh, but the fact is that many of the couples that we see uh, come to us actually when it's already too late. And many of them said, well, if we knew, if we could frozen our eggs or whatever. So that, that actually now is a possibility. And of course, with every new development, every new technology, there comes a lot of ethical issues, a lot of controversy. Um, but uh, I, I think at this point in time, I think it's a reasonable thing to offer single women who are basically worried about missing the window of opportunity. Mm. And you know, we can talk about cutoff for age and cutoff for hormone testing and all that later, but I think it's a reasonable um, uh, thing to, to do. So uh, as far as the main indications, as I said, is basically we use it for egg donation to have frozen eggs uh, from donors. We use it for women who undergo treatment. And more and more now for cases where there is an interest in preserving uh, fertility. So uh, I think I'll stop here because I can <laughs> keep going for an hour. But. No, thanks for the introduction. I think you know what I find in insurance and the visitors we get at the site, it is predominantly single women, um, career women that 
don't want to miss that opportunity, and I'll segue into Clock Tickers sure. or um, the book that Sarah just wrote, which gives a really fascinating glimpse at the lives of four women who go through sort of an egg freezing journey. And one of my questions for you, I know that I'm seeing this as a woman I talk to, but is there some common bond or commonality that you see, um, you know, why women are starting sure. to freeze their eggs? Sure. So my name's Sarah Elizabeth Richards. I wrote a book called Motherhood Rescheduled, The New Frontier of Egg Freezing and the Women Who Tried It. And what my goal was, I wanted to find that first generation of women who froze their eggs and ask the question, if you could stop your clock, if what would you do with your life? How would you live your life? Would it change the outcome? And so the common, the common theme that the women in I, my book that I chose to profile shared mm -hmm. is that they were all like 38, 39, and I think they were coming to a point in their lives where they felt that their back was up against the wall. And if mm. they didn't do something now, they were gonna lose the mm. chance to have a biological child. One woman um, had a failed engagement. Another woman had just gone through a, a divorce and was dating some guy, but he already had kids and wasn't sure he wanted more kids. So she was kind of in this place where she didn't really know where to go in her life. And she, like many women of that generation, had read a lot of she had seen a lot of People magazine covers that, you know, says, have a baby in your 40s. And she really didn't have a sense that in her late 30s that her window was going to close soon. And then another woman, you know, she'd had a lot of little mini relationships, but she'd never had a real boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And they think she was really worried that, well, gosh, well, what, what would make me think that I would get my life lined up to have to make this all happen for me in the next mm -hmm. couple of years? So they, what they shared is that they didn't really feel like they had a lot of options, and they had a lot of time, and so they learned about this technology. Mm -hmm. And when you first hear about this technology, it's just the premise of it, the mm -hmm. opportunity, the idea that you can you know, freeze your eggs and get out of the situation mm -hmm. and basically buy yourself a few more years to find the guy, to get your career in order, to be in a place where you could have children. I think mm -hmm. that was that's such an amazing promise. So what I wanted to do was find out what happened if you froze your eggs, mm -hmm. like what would happen to those women after? Would they make better decisions in, th in their love lives, in their work lives? Mm -hmm. Would it, if this is the, the mechanism that would sort of change everything, did it mm -hmm. actually change things for the better? And so that's the question I, I sought, sought to answer. And without sort of, you know, wrecking the end <laughs> of the book, I mean, and you all should read this if you are interested in egg freezing. It's really the first book that has documented egg freezing, and I scour, you know, for <laughs> books and information. But, you know, at the end, did did you see where I know I know the ending, but um, they're very divergent paths. That there are, and I mean, I'll this yeah. part isn't a secret, but I wanted to find some women who it worked and some women it didn't work for. What ended up happening is. I chose these women, I followed them throughout, and it worked mm -hmm. for some, it didn't work for others. That's just sort of how it happened, which is realistic because we know it's not going to work for everybody. Mm -hmm. There's a certain percentage rate, depending on your age, what the chances of it are working. And so the woman it did work out for, I mean, her story, it was, mm -hmm. it was great. She had a baby at 45. She's got a the little girl just started kindergarten. Mm -hmm. it's, I see her pictures on Facebook. It's a lovely story. You know, the, the one that didn't work out for, um, she tried donor eggs. Mm -hmm. She found another way to have children. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one important thing about egg freezing. You know, a lot of people are under um, the pretense that you freeze your eggs, you're guaranteed a child. And I think one thing, if you can get anything out of this session is, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not a guarantee that your eggs are going to be viable. But one thing that happened in my life, and maybe Sarah shares this, is I did something proactive. Um, and even if I was talking to Dr. Griffo from NYU earlier, and he, a patient shared the same sentiment that even if I don't, even if my eggs are not successful, um, I was proactive in my initiative, and that's that makes me feel like I've done everything I can. And I think that's um, you know the one thing that you you don't freeze your eggs and you're going to have a child whenever you want. You know you defrost them. It's not like taking something out of the freezer and going you know, but it gives you that opportunity and I, or potential. So I mean, I think that's the key thing to, to keep in mind with any sort of IVF or any kind of fertility treatment. Sure. And one of the surprising things I found in the book is that even for mm -hmm. some of the women who didn't work for, one, they found other ways to become mothers. Mm -hmm. 
And the second thing, it gave them a psychological benefit yeah. they hadn't anticipated. And mm -hmm. that's, I think, the new thing we're discovering yeah. is like you're talking the mm -hmm. sense that you've taken control of your life, that you've yeah. taken charge of your fertility. And what that does for you is so huge yeah. mm -hmm. that I think that's hopefully what we're going to learn more about how this how mm -hmm. this technology changes women's lives in so many ways. Yeah, I think the most interesting thing is, you know, people say, what's the hardest part about egg freezing? It's not the needles, it's not the physical, it's the emotional um, sort of turmoil of, should I do this, when should I do this, how should I do this, can I afford it? And I've, I was talking to um, a psychologist a few, a few weeks ago, and she mm -hmm. was saying that a lot of women, it takes them a couple years to mm -hmm. actually make the decision to freeze, which, you know, I wish they would take them yeah. a shorter amount of time because they're wasting those years yeah. deciding. But once they once they freeze, it's like flips, and they're like, <sighs> and it's, yeah. they feel a sense of relief. So, um, Dr. Lube, I have a question about. Um, there's lots of different, you know, in terms of a lot of clinics right now offering egg freezing, and a lot of them have been doing it a while. Some are relatively new. What would you say um, to a patient, a woman that's going in and in terms of what she should look for in a clinic or the key questions she should be asking or the questions you want to hear a patient asking that you know they're well informed? Yeah, I, I think um, I have to admit that I often do that, sort of try to put myself on the other side of mm -hmm. the table. And, uh, you know, how do you really make a decision about anything, uh, any physician? Because at the end, I think it's just a matter of feeling comfortable enough and trusting enough. Uh, because nowadays, pe nowadays people tend to do a lot of their own research and feel that they're like uh, experts, mini yeah. experts, and, <laughs> um, which is fine. But but I, I think at the end, you know, you have to actually, and I do it myself from when I when I need uh, some medical help. You have to find somebody you trust, and you don't then you let them worry about it, and let them uh, tell you what you need to do. Um, you know, as as far as IVF, it's a little bit. There's sort of, of course, a very technical aspect of it. And, uh, you know, egg freezing, of course, is IVF, and that ultimately the eggs are going to be thawed and fertilized, and embryos are created, and so forth. So you need to obviously pick a place that is a good IVF program, a good IVF clinic, uh, which is also very, very difficult to do because there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of marketing nowadays, unfortunately. So it, it really is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you need to pick someone who is well-trained, experienced. There are some regulatory bodies. There's board certification and so forth. But ultimately, I think at the end is having the right chemistry, the right connection. And and the other thing that, I, as far as is, um, I, I guess if if you get accepted too quickly to the program, that also is a little bit of a uh, of a, of a warning that maybe something isn't right because, you know, it's it, to me it's always been a big responsibility. And in fact, um, we went, when we were using the slow freeze, and we in, in fact had the first success uh, successful egg freezing pregnancy in Connecticut. This was um, not quite ten years ago, but a while ago. I I've always felt very uncomfortable because I knew that it really wasn't a good method. And the success was very low. The survival was low. The fertilization was low. So you had to be really, really lucky. And in fact, that sort of always brings back, you know, the early days of IVF. Because when I started doing IVF, um, you know, the success rates were 5 percent, 10 percent. I mean, that was a time where we would put back five or six or seven embryos, just hoping that one will take. So you know, I, we were sort of back in the same place. This time, talking to women about freezing eggs and telling them, well, you know, we don't really know how many eggs you have to have frozen. Maybe you should do it a few times. And I, I probably, in most of these cases, I sort of turned people away, just because I think people can sort of read into how you feel when you present it to them, and they decided not to do it. And I've changed my view on this completely, because not only the methodology has improved, but also we have much better testing to look at what we call the ovarian reserve, ovarian function, which translates basically into egg production, egg viability, and success. And you know, it, it of course, age is a factor. But I, you know, just being a, a I, I have my, my clinic in Connecticut, uh, and I'm the only physician. I've been doing it for a long time by myself. So you know, it's it's um, 
you have to basically be convinced for yourself that, that the methodology is good. Um, and it's a little bit easier now to tell people, you know, that your ovarian reserve is such and such. You know, you're not a good candidate. You can be 35 years old. But, uh, you know, again, being, uh, I'm sort of the ethics committee and I'm the executive <laughs> committee. Uh, so I don't really have a, a cutoff as far as age mm -hmm. because I don't really believe that, I mean, age is, is a statistic, yes, but when you look at an individual person, uh, it's really more about what their genetics are, what their ovaries are like. So you can have young women that have really bad ovarian function, and you can have women in their 40s that have great ovaries. So that's, that's also a very important consideration as far as trying to figure out who you're going to work with. Great. Um, and I would recommend getting tested <laughs> earlier. Um, a lot of people don't know that there is testing available, FSH, AMH, um, things that, you know, just in terms of a lot of women are not clued in about their own fertility, um, and I wasn't. <laughs> and one question I have for you is you've been very vocal in the press as well as your sure. book about your journey and other, and, you know, egg freezing can be a very private and sort of personal topic. Why have you chosen to sort of um, <laughs> get on the egg freezing <laughs> soapbox or, yeah? Well, I'll be honest, the, the way I got interested in this book, this book subject was because I was interested in freezing my eggs. I was 35. I had been in a really long relationship, like an eight-year relationship in my late 20s, early 30s. I was dating. I thought I would meet somebody pretty quickly, and I met someone, but he wasn't sure he wanted kids. So I was like, oh, that's really wasn't the brightest thing. Mm -hmm. So I've been going on in this relationship for a few years, and it wasn't clear which way we were going. And so I was 35, and I've always wanted children, and I think for me, that was kind of the freak out point. I remember I was in like a Starbucks. I had like a little back of a card and I was trying to like <laughs> plot out my timeline. I'm like, well, if I meet, if I have a child at this date, then uh, what about a second child? And so it was just like, oh my gosh, I really don't have that many years in my mm -hmm. late 30s left. So I heard about it heard about egg freezing. I talked to a friend about it and she says, I actually heard the technology's gotten a lot better. Mm -hmm. So I thought, wow, this is something I should really look into. And I would talk about it with a lot of other friends and it was one of those things, I always wanted to write a book, but mm -hmm. when you're talking with somebody, you can't stop talking about it. People mm -hmm. would say, but what about, you know, Meredith? If she had frozen her eggs, would she be with that guy? I'm like, no, mm -hmm. she wouldn't be in that terrible marriage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or this other woman, you know, what would she have done? And so. I just thought, gosh, there's something here worth exploring. Anyway, I froze my eggs, and I was with this man. It was a lovely relationship, but we ultimately didn't have the same goals. We broke up. I was in my late 30s. I went back on match. I've met somebody I've been dating a year. He's a divorced dad who wants more kids. Mm -hmm. And so I'm 43 now. I don't know if I just said that. And hopefully we'll fall next summer. So it's, you know, hopefully that's, you know, we'll all work as it should. Mm -hmm. Which leads me to another question about um, what, who you're seeing at your clinic in terms of the profile of the patient, um, in terms of age or? Well, um, actually, it's a good question because uh, it's getting better. Mm. I think it's getting better because the, there's more uh, information out there, not just uh, with the public, but I think also with the medical community. Because, you know, women often would follow the advice of their gynecologists who would tell them, you know, don't worry, you still have plenty of time. Um, and again, end up coming in and where it is too late. Uh, so I think there's more education, more information out there. Mm -hmm. So whereas, you know, 10 years ago, uh, women, the, women or the, the women that would come in were in their 40s. Mm -hmm. And then it's really not. I mean, the technology was bad. They, they, they were a little too old for it. Uh, but now, actually, you see more women that are actually real candidates. Mm -hmm. So that has actually gotten better. Um, again, but still, there, unfortunately, there's quite a bit of misinformation or lack of information out there. Mm -hmm. And you know, you mentioned the AMH, uh, which I don't know how many of you know, but it's one of the newer tests for ovarian function, ovarian reserve. Uh, the golden standard that's been around forever, uh, the gold standard was always FSH, which um, unfortunately with FSH, when the levels go up, 
which means that the ov ovaries are starting to slow down, it's generally too late. Uh, this newer hormone, uh, it's not a new hormone, but it's a new test that we use, uh, actually is a much more early indicator of ovarian function and changes way, way before the FSH. So um, again, people always ask, so I did the testing and it's normal, you know, how long is it good for? Yeah. You know, should I check it again in six months, in a year? I mean, these things don't change that quickly, usually, most of the time. Uh, but having a normal FSH and a normal AMH is very reassuring, at least for a year. So, uh, I mean, you can also use that to counsel people that say, well, you know, should I do it now? Should I wait? Do I have time? I mean, as long as your numbers are normal, normal, then you probably do have some time. So you don't, there's no urgency. But once you see that the AMH starts to sh go down, start to drift down, uh, while the FSH is normal, that's actually a very good window of, of uh, opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. So, Sarah, one of my questions, and this might be, um, there's been a, a lot of press recently about, you know, egg freezing, and there's been a lot of sort of negative comments, mm -hmm. and um, which, you know, I think we all have our opinions on egg freezing. Hopefully everyone in the room, you know, is of, <laughs> of a similar opinion, but what... Um, what do you, because I know you've been vocal in the press, sure. what do you say to the people that, you know, are sort of negative to your... Well, one of the biggest worries or concerns, which is a legitimate concern, mm -hmm. is that we're going to push the age of motherhood too old. Mm -hmm. The whole, there's a fear that if you could stop your clock, if you could put your eggs on ice, that, well, I mean, who wants to think about these things? Yeah. Who wants to think about going on Match.com? Who wants to think about having to do those things that get you in a place where you could have a family. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes they're not fun. It's not fun going on a million dates. <laughs> but, but, so that was the fear. And then all mm -hmm. of a sudden they would wake up at 45 and go, oh shoot, I was supposed to be doing yeah. that. What I found in the women I profiled is that didn't happen. Actually going through the process of freezing their eggs helped them feel, made them realize their goals more. I think for a lot of women who weren't sure about Maybe they knew they wanted to be mothers, but mm -hmm. they weren't quite sure where they fell on the spectrum. When you commit to freezing your eggs, when you spend the money, when you go through the process, when you inject yourself, you kind of make a decision in your head that, gosh, maybe I really do want a baby. So I think by helping them define their goals more and commit themselves to the process of actually going through it, they became more committed, they dated, they got mm -hmm. married, you know, if that's what they were interested in. So that didn't, in, in my experience or in my small sample, mm -hmm. that didn't happen, that they didn't just put it off forever. But then the other question is, let's say the woman in my book who had a baby with a frozen egg, you know, she did it at 45. Well, mm -hmm. is that too old? And so it brings up a lot of questions like, you know, how old can we really expect to live? How fair would it, at what age could you die and leave a kid? Is a 30 year old? I mean, is it okay to die when your kid's 30 or 40? It just brings up all of those big questions, which I think are, are really fair. You know, should you be able to thaw your eggs at 50? What about 55? It, so I think those are the things we're all trying to figure out as a society. In my own case, you know, I, the way my life is turning out is that I would have a baby at 44 and hopefully a second by 46. So mm -hmm. that's my comfort level. I think that would be okay. For some people, maybe that's not. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on you know, where, where it all comes and shakes out, and I guess what our own comfort. Do you have a, an age limit on when you would thaw for a woman? No. You know, I, we, we struggled with this actually way before egg freezing become, became a, a reality because we were doing egg donation. All right. Mm -hmm. And this is, sort of brings up exactly the same issues. I mean, do you do it for 45-year-olds? So would you do it for 50-year-olds? So what if she was 52? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've made a decision early um, um, that I, you know, I, I don't want to be judging people based on my own views. And I, I think, you know, I, I had, you know, one case, uh, which is always, you know, all the bad publicity always happens because cases that are very mm -hmm. rare. So I had a woman who was 60 years old and um, lost her teenage uh, son. And she, she basically uh, came and wanted to use an egg donor and I was very uncomfortable because, like you said, I mean, you know, she's 60 and she's going to be pregnant and, you know, she's not going to live forever. So we spent about a year actually trying to, I, I tried to actually uh, 
talk her out of it, and she was very adamant. And I said, well, now you have to do a stress test and a physical. And, mm -hmm. and basically, I mean, she did bas exactly what I asked. And so I finally, I said, no, you know, I said, well, I sort of pushed myself to a corner, and I did it, and she did conceive. Mm -hmm. And this is oh, more than five years ago, and she's doing well, and the kids are good. And so, but, uh, you know, it, it's always been a dilemma, and, and it's always very difficult to set uh, a number, to give a number. Because like you said, well, 50 is all right, but 51 is not. Right. So if 51 is all right. So it definitely is uh, you know, what we call a slippery slope. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think if you look at individual people, and you know, we never, people that get pregnant naturally never go in front of a committee to see if they're OK to be parents. <laughs> uh, so that's why I don't put myself in that position. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that you know, they understand what they're getting ill to if, if they're single that you know, they have a guardian if something happens to them. I mean, all these things that I can do to ensure that for my own conscience that, that it's going to be OK. But I don't believe in actually setting mm -hmm. strict numbers. Right. Mm -hmm. I've heard of some doctors, if you know, say a woman is th a 55, that the husband or partner could be, or whether it's female or male partner, could be no older than 45. So mm -hmm. the idea is that the, the joint group or the joint age, the combined age would be no more than 100. Oh. 100. So that someone's <laughs> around to take care of that child or to be in that child's life. So, but, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. so one question we get a lot on egg insurance yes. um, is how many eggs is enough? Yes. And, you know, I, I did one cycle. Maybe I should have done two. I mean, it's, do you have, I know, it's all, you know, I know you don't have a definitive number, no, no, I, but I, a range. I, 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 yeah. You know, the, the thing is, you have to think of when you freeze your eggs, you have to basically give the statistic of the mm -hmm. odds of success as if you were doing IVF right now. Mm -hmm. So if you're 39 years old and you're doing IVF right now, and you're going to transfer two embryos or three embryos, you may have a 40 or 50% chance of success. Mm -hmm. So to get two or three good embryos, you need about five or six eggs. Mm. So if you want to have one chance, you need that many. If you want to mm. have more than one chance, you have to have twice as many. So I, I think you know, I've come to sort of in my head to get somewhere about eight to 10 eggs. I think that's mm. sort of it. Because now, as I said, the survival is really good. If mm. the eggs are good, then they do survive over 90%. So it used to be that you know, in order to get two good embryos, you had to have 15 or 20 eggs. This is in the, in the old mm. technology. So I, I think having 10 eggs, and again, I mean, there's never enough. I mean, yeah. we, we get the same questions from uh, guys that freeze their sperm. I said, mm -hmm. how many samples yeah. should yeah. I give? <laughs> Two, three, 10. We have, I have one guy who came 20 times to give samples because he wanted to be 100% sure. <laughs> so I think you, know, you have to be realistic. And you have, like you said, that you, know, you have to realize that it's IVF, and it's not perfect, and it doesn't mm -hmm. always work. But you know, I think ha having two attempts mm -hmm. Um, is, is basically where most, I think most people would agree that you get most of the success. If you have to do it more than t twice and it doesn't work, then chances are it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the way to try and come up with a number. Okay. And Sarah, one, um, I didn't do much in terms of preparation because I decided pretty quickly, mm -hmm. but when you decided to freeze your eggs, did you do any holistic diet or anything to, you know, no. sort of <laughs> <laughs> acupuncture? No. No. I mean, I took fish oil pills. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> You're supposed to do that anyway, so yeah. yeah, nothing. But that's a good question. Yeah. I know that, you know, we, we know more every day, you mm -hmm. know, shouldn't drink, shouldn't do, like, there are things that yeah. you can do. Mm -hmm. but you never think of that prior to egg freezing, you just think of it prior to conceiving, but it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty much the same thing, so. Yeah. Um, what, this is one thing I struggled with prior to freezing my eggs was, is it better to freeze an egg or an embryo? Well, it used to be that. Without a it, known sperm or without yeah, a. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it yeah. used to be, like I said, it used to be mm -hmm. that it, was, it would have been much better to freeze an embryo. Mm -hmm. Because starting in the actually late 1980s, Mm -hmm. uh, we already had reasonably good success with embryos. Mm -hmm. So in, in fact, what I used to do until a few years ago uh, is for women who really wanted to do it and I couldn't convince them not to do it, I would say, you know what, just split your eggs mm -hmm. and fertilize half with donor mm -hmm. and make embryos and freeze the embryos and keep the other half. So mm -hmm. hopefully, if you're lucky, we can get the eggs to survive. But if not, we definitely get the embryos. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so at the moment there really is no difference. It's it's hard yeah. to believe because, especially for 
those of us who sort of have lived through all these different eras of IVF, but there really is no difference between fresh sperm, frozen sperm, fresh embryos, frozen embryos, the same with eggs. Um, well, I think we can actually go to um, some questions in the audience or online. Yes, sir. Hi. I, I was in and out during the course of your talk, so I don't know if the question that I'm going to ask has already been answered, but is there a sh shelf life for frozen eggs? Uh, good question. Good question. Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, amazingly not. You know, the, the, because the, the cells in general, when they're frozen, uh, they're frozen to liquid nitrogen temperature. Uh, and at that temperature, actually, all the biological activity in the cell stops. It's not like putting you know, meat in the refrigerator and the, meta the metabolic activity slows down significantly so it can last for six months. But here is no difference. And in fact, there have been studies with mouse embryos Going, going on now for over 20 years, where they froze the embryos and every year they thaw a few and there was no difference. So as long as you keep them, you know, as if you fill the tank and you have somebody watching to make sure it doesn't run empty, then there's no difference. How close to absolute zero do you have to be? Well, it's, uh, it's, not, it's, a, it's a minus 196, which is the liquid nitrogen temperature, so there, which yeah, is so enough there. to basically stop all the... Um, biological activity of the cell. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's pretty, right. pretty amazing to see, you know, we've, I mean, it was just in the, in the news uh, that a baby born from an embryo that was frozen for 10 years. Wow. I've had one from seven years. It's, it's sort of a little strange. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can have, uh, I mean, there are all kinds of implications about a future generation fertilizing the previous generation. I mean, like I said, there's a million, you know, from day one, from day one, there's a, a million ethical issues uh, in fact, there was in the there was in the mid '80s, there was an Australian couple who very wealthy couple that froze their embryos, and they had I don't remember how many embryos, and they both died in a plane crash, and it was a huge, you know, argument what to do because it's you know people wanted the the inheritance they had no other relatives, and they basically wanted to make those children so they can be the heirs of the fortune that they have. So, you know, there's a million things. In every step of the way, in every angle, uh, there's some ethical issues. So we, I, my philosophy is always try and keep it simple, because you can, if you make it complicated, you can make yourself yeah. crazy. And let the patient decide, as you yes. indicated earlier. One, one other question. Do you do um, genetic testing on, on these eggs before you freeze them, or any kind of testing of that type? Uh, no. It's, it's actually difficult to do genetic testing on eggs. Um, so we don't. I mean, the genetic testing that is done mostly is done on embryos. And it's done after the actually embryo is reached. Uh, I'm sure you've heard some of the talks today. So no, at the moment, we don't. We, we actually have a method of looking uh, more closely at the structure of the egg uh, to tell you if basically if it's a normal egg. But uh, it's, not, it's not very um, accurate. Um, I was just wondering. Uh, how, if there's a percentage or like a, a, a percentage of the embryos or sorry, the eggs that survive the thaw, like how many do you lose on average, for example? Um, I know that it's going to be different for every person, but I was just wondering about, about that. Well, it's interesting that, uh, you know, if, if you look at, at fresh eggs or fresh uh, embryos, uh, the, the rule of thumb is more or less that about half of the eggs a little bit more than half of the eggs turn into good embryos. So most of them will fertilize, and most of those that fertilize develop, and about half will turn into good embryos. And it turns out that basically the same is true with eggs. And uh, interestingly enough, because there's always a question about the damage that the freezing can cause, and there was recently some studies on sperm, because those are the easiest to study. Um, and the studies actually show that uh, the sample, actually, after the freeze, after the thaw, uh, is often better than the sample that you had before. And you know, if, yeah, most times people react the way you just did. Uh, I'm just being but the reason <laughs> is that actually, you know, it's like putting the sperm through a, um, a stress test. You know, the ones that are weak sort of just mm. die off, and you end up with the stronger ones. And I, I believe that that's true for eggs, and I believe it's true for embryos. And in fact, you know, at the very early days, again, we would just create the embryos, transfer a few, and freeze whatever's left without really looking too closely. 
And that turned out that when you thaw them, many of them don't make it. So now we spend a lot of time actually with embryos making sure that they're good before they're frozen. So we keep them growing for a little bit longer to make sure that they're good. Um, so you know, I, there's no reason to think any differently about eggs. Because not as I said, about 90% plus of the eggs survive. And those eggs that don't are probably not good. Do we have some online questions? We do. We have a few, actually. But right. uh, we'll just try. I think we probably have time for one. Okay. So can you comment on how uh, the price or the, how expensive it is to freeze your eggs? Is it based on where you do it or how many you do? Uh, about where you do it, I don't know. Yes, it's where you do uh, it as well, yeah. I'm sure it does. I mean, the process is, you know, involves using the fertility drugs, mm -hmm. uh, and which actually, uh, you know, that's sort of a significant part of the cost. Uh, it partly is the, is the monitoring. It's, it's less expensive. I don't know the exact cost, but it's less expensive, of course, than doing an IVF cycle because you basically take the eggs and harvest the eggs and freeze them right away. Mm -hmm. So that entire portion of the IVF uh, process that involves the growing the embryos, cr you know, creating them, growing them, and so forth, obviously is, is missing. And that is sort of comes in at the end, on the, on the, on the other end. I, sorry, I can answer that question, and it's more specific dollars and cents. Um, on average, for the procedure, it's eight to 12,000. Um, but that doesn't include your drugs, which can run three to six. So when you're being quoted by a doctor, you know, you need to factor in the drugs, which are, you know, very expensive. And, you know, when you get this huge box of $4,000 drugs that you have to put into your fridge, you do it very quickly and very carefully. But make sure when you, you know, when you are talking to a clinic what those costs are, because there can be a lot of hidden costs um, that you might not be aware of. So make sure they're very transparent about what the costs are up front, but don't forget about the the medication because that is a big chunk of your procedure and some clinics are offering discounts on multiple cycles and a lot of women um, are doing multiple cycles with the you know hopes of maybe one or two children so um, there are a lot of questions in terms of costs in some places I found some insurance companies are covering a little bit or initial testing so you know, do ask insurance companies and or work the business office of the clinic. So there are ways that, you know, you can sort of navigate the cost. It is steep, but it might save multiple IVF treatments in the end, so. And it's coming down in a lot of mm. markets. Um, I've heard lots of reports that it's been offered for $5,000, okay. especially in like, I think Los Angeles and some places mm. in Massachusetts as well. It's getting more competitive price-wise. Yeah. We have one more. Yep. Yeah, sure. mm -hmm. This time, that's great. Uh, oh, I lost it. Let's see. The, the next one was actually still on the topic of optimizing your body. I know we talked about it a little bit, but this is to to Dr. Levy. Is there any benefit to optimizing your fertility before you go in to freeze your eggs? Like, would you get more eggs, or truly is it just you know your health is your health and you're you're okay? Well, um, you know that's sort of a, another question you can take about three hours to answer. <laughs> but the the simple fact, I, I think, when you look at couples that come in to, uh, with infertility, I think there's maybe a little bit um, overemphasis on that in, in the sense that they basically change their whole life. They stop drinking, they stop going out, they you know, low, stop working. And I think that's not really necessary uh, for most part. Uh, I think having a you know, sort of a healthy lifestyle, balanced diet, maybe taking some vitamins, but that's about it. I mean, it's not, uh, it's, not, it's not really necessary to make any drastic changes. Mm. Great. OK, well, I think we're, we're at the end of our session. And thank you all for joining us. And um, if you want any on, more information on the speakers, please go to fertilityplanet.com. And we thank, again, the New England Fertility Institute for sponsoring this panel. And. Um, you can see all the sessions starting tomorrow at Fora TV. Um, so everything will be streaming live there. And thank you both to our panelists. We thank appreciate you. you being here and talking about egg freezing. And thanks to the audience for joining us again. Thank you.